Hi everybody, Eric Alexander at Tecton Design here, and I want to circle back on one of our most popular videos, and that is the topic of 8 ohms versus 4 ohms. If you want to be a short watcher, I'll cut straight to the chase. In my personal opinion, I believe that 8 ohms should be regarded as an older, obsolete type impedance. So there you go, there's my short answer. Now there are situations where 8 ohms is still uh, required and still used very, very commonly uh, in the audiophile realm. And most specifically, that would be the vintage tube amplifier scene that's very popular. And we even offer loudspeakers that are specifically geared for that in the, in the true 8 ohm impedance. So um, before, before we started running this video, I, I set two of our 10 inch woofers up that uh, we've, we, this, this is the woofer that we use in the double impact and the woofer that we use in the 210 perfect set and in the Pendragon. So we buy a lot of these and we've had Eminence make this in two impedances specifically, eight ohms and four ohms. And right before we did the video, I just wanted to reconfirm something that I've been aware of for the last uh, three and a half decades, is that we took the forum version and we, we shot this and we got a specific output. We took the 8 ohm version and we shot it and lo and behold, it was exactly 3 dB lower in output. Now, I don't want to upset anybody. I've done enough of that lately. I don't want to upset anybody. So listen very carefully here. Just like the last video on this topic, I am coming from the angle of acoustical physics, not Ohm's law and electronics. You've got to understand that <clears throat> once the current goes through the voice coil, this is a, a moving piston. It's modulating the air. We're getting sound waves. Um, here's a sound wave, okay? So we didn't have to zap that with current to get sound. We, that's, that's how this works. So from the angle of a loudspeaker designer, I'm here to say that four ohms and even two ohms under certain circumstances, and by the way, you're looking at our two ohm Pendragon, which um, if you go to uh, YouTube, you'll find uh, one of our reviewers, that's uh, Jay up in Canada. He reviewed the two ohm Pendragon and he was stunned by what he received. He talks about it in his video. So while most audiophiles are not interested in two ohm, it's probably the best review we've ever had. And as these modern amplifiers, especially the class D topology, the pulse width modulation, two ohms is becoming very common. We're getting re ready to release a two ohm subwoofer uh, that's manufactured by BNC in Italy that's under the iPAL logo. Uh, so we're gonna have one ohm and two ohm subwoofers. And so I'll circle back on this four ohm versus eight ohms. <clears throat> when you pull up, and, and I would just advise you to go to Stereophile, look at John Atkinson's measurements, pull up, for example, a Bryston amplifier. Um, that, that's the first one that comes to my mind. There's a lot. I'm not, I'm not playing favorites with anybody, but if you look at these <clears throat> wattage, current, impedance relationships from these amplifiers, it's, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see and understand very, very quickly that an amplifier in 8 ohm mode is 200 watts per channel, and it's got a very low distortion. And then the 4 ohm scenario from the same amplifier typically has 400. So I've said this a hundred times in phone calls. The way to, again, don't get upset with me. I'm not talking about Ohm's law. I'm talking about as a loudspeaker designer in acoustical physics, when, when, when the cone is actually being moved. Uh, in fact, the cone doesn't care what's moving it. It's producing sound. Right now it's my fingertips, okay? We have to just focus in on that. So if we went to this Chevy dealership and we walk up to the salesman and say, hey, we're here to buy a brand new Corvette. And he says, well, that's great. Uh, today we have a special deal for you. 
and, and I believe this is really a good parallel. I'll, the last parallel that I used, we had cylinder heads for dragsters. We had racing engine cylinder heads and that rubbed a few hardcore audio files the wrong way. And um, that's one of the reasons why I pulled that down. I didn't want to upset anybody. However, I will say that <laughs> in almost four years of that video, there was not one, not one triple E, um, electronics guy, audiophile, another manufacturer, an amplifier man manufacturer reach out to me and say, Eric, you know what, dude, um, you're, you're off base here. In fact, quite the contrary. There was, there was a lot of upset people and um, I got a lot of ad hominem attacks, but not one attack that actually held water because this video is going to be the same way. If you've listened to what I've said already, Four ohms is superior to two ohms, and the only margin for debate would be if we want to listen to um, our playback. Now, keep in mind, we're talking levels that only um, reside in, in bat hearing and spidey senses, if you know what I mean. So we're, we're, we're talking very minute levels of distortion, for the most part, inaudible distortion. So we have really, really low distortion and really low distortion. That's that's the that's the trade-off relationship here, is that we can get double our power. Now, as typically audiophiles, you have you have a, le a reference playback level, so you want to have more reserve on tap. So I'll go back to this Chevy analogy here. So we show up at the dealership and we say we're here to buy a Corvette, and the salesman says, "Well, the." Um, they're $130,000. We have a really special promotion going. We have the version with 400 horsepower and we have an identical version with 800 horsepower. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And again, I don't want to upset anybody, but that's exactly what we're talking about. Do you want to have access to 200 watts of brute force power or do you want to have access to 400 watts of brute force power? by converting and buying into this concept of going with four ohms? And furthermore, do you wanna go into the realm of a two ohm speaker, which we offer, and call me up, happy to talk to you about that. Do we wanna go into a two ohm speaker that gets you to 800 watts? It all costs the same, folks, and amplifiers have progressed. You couldn't have really done this in the 60s and the 70s. Arguably, maybe in the 80s, there were a few amplifiers that were uh, I'm coming to my mind, like the Heffler gear and, and the Adcom thing and, and stuff like that. So there were amplifiers, but as they've evolved, and especially with Class D, there's pro amplifiers. Um, I'm thinking of iPal. You know, I know Italian speaker companies right now that are making one ohm, uh, one ohm loudspeakers. So things have evolved, things have progressed. They've gotten much better. And, and, and so there's your, there's your four ohm and your eight ohm dichotomy. Just to come full circle, I just wanna to touch on a couple more things. That is, again, my belief that four ohms is superior to eight ohms most of the time, nearly all of the time, with the exception of the tube amplifier scene, uh, especially tube amplifiers that don't have the four ohm tap, these vintage topologies then we want to we want to guide you towards something like our perfect set lineup that's true eight ohms and not only that but we make the pen dragon we make the double impact we make the moab all in an eight ohm speaker for those that want that we we can absolutely do that the other thing that i want to touch on is the home theater application that would be the home theater processors like a denon or marantz uh, yamaha onkyo etc those if you dig deep in the owner's manual, you'll see that a lot of times they say it's for a six ohm speaker. We've got 10,000 speakers done for home theaters that are running on receivers like that in four ohms. It's a very steady, benign four ohm impedance. If the lid of the amplifier, top of the amplifier isn't covered, um, if it's not entrapped inside of a cabinet and the heat can't escape, you're never going to have a problem. You're just not going to have a problem. We have not, I'm not aware of a single person that's had a problem. When you have a 95 plus dB sensitive speaker 
and most audiophiles are very predictable with their habits. Um, it, I'll say it like this. If, if you've got 200 watts on tap or 400 watts on tap, most audiophiles tend to have a playback reference level that's consistent night in and night out over time. So you're just not going to push that. And, and of course, if you do want to get into the raucous mood and the house, the house party mode, you've got a lot of extra wattage on tap to take care of that. So anyway, hopefully that's uh, we're done on that topic and we'll talk to you soon.